Hey everyone, it's May 7th, 2017. This is your episode 96 of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as usual are my friends, Ben Charles. Hey everyone. And Laurel Black. Hi. Ben, how's the end of your semester going? It is going well. We're done. We just have juries on Tuesday, and I will have completed my first year. Cool. And you still have a job, so you did it. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't get fired yet. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you have to have some kind of first year review type of thing? No, it's uh, my position is is weird, and I think I have to probably do that in two years. But yeah, nothing like that yet. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, it's nice to probably yeah get the ropes for a year, and then your actual review you'll have already had a year's experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Well, guys, our guest today. Uh, one of them is a percussion instructor at Northridge High School in Middlebury, Indiana. Laurel and I met him while teaching at the Ted Adcats Percussion Seminar in Maine. And we met back up recently in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where we met our other guests. And this was at the Indiana Music Educators Association Conference. So big thanks to Mark Woldridge for bringing us out there and making all of that happen. And let's see, so Micah has one of those high school percussion ensembles that makes you say, whoa, wait a minute, this is a high school. These guys are really good. <laughs> and Christian Good, sitting next to Micah there, he gave us this awesome tour of the Sweetwater uh, facility. And he's an audio tech for the Cavaliers from 2014 to 2016 and has also taught at Goshen High School alongside someone named Derek Shannon. So hello to Micah Detweiler and Christian Good. How are you guys? Hello, doing hey. really well. Same here. Excited to be here. Yeah, good. Well, thanks for being thank here. And Micah, Micah and Christian, why don't you guys give us just a little update on, I don't know, what life's like for you lately? Uh, well, uh, the semester's winding down for me at Northridge. We, since we're high school, we usually go until almost June, I think. Our graduation <laughs> is on June 4th, and that's our last official event. And being in Indiana, that means that we are already starting up marching band for next fall. Um, so I've got drumline clinics coming up where we do um, kind of a little overview and audition of what we're going to be working on and get them some new exercises and set the line. And then we'll have a few formal rehearsals at the end of this year. And then we get a, at least a couple months off before we dive into uh, super intense band camps for a couple weeks. And then we're back at school again. So that's what I'm working on. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, for myself, I'm just uh, still in Fort Wayne working at Sweetwater as a sales engineer, which I absolutely love. Uh, probably the biggest thing we have coming up, um, or for myself personally as well, is we have a, a annual event called Gear Fest, which draws about, uh, I want to say, close to 12,000 or more people to the Fort Wayne area and a lot of manufacturers, which is our big like on-campus event. So we have that to look forward to in the end of June. Uh, in addition, I also do quite a bit of uh, uh, extracurricular kind of um, projects as far as working with other marching bands and doing cons consultations things like that and so i've already been involved with with quite uh quite a bit of that as well mm -hmm. gearing up here in indiana for the yeah. marching band season and so. wgi just and, finished yeah, up yeah wgi so. just finished up which is a phenomenal season overall a uh, lot a lot of great shows i think this is the first year in quite a while where for me personally i just absolutely was floored by everybody in the t in really all the groups i mean they really brought it yeah. so yeah yeah very very cool when you say uh this event's coming on campus, you mean to Sweetwater? Yeah, so, you know, Fort Wayne being the second largest city in Indiana still is uh, not not very well-known globally, I would say, or nationally, but uh, we have people travel from all over the country. A lot of people are from the Midwest, but we have, um, you know, a ton of manufacturers uh, such as Pearl, Yamaha, Gibson. I mean, you name it, they make music instruments, they're there. Uh, and tents set, across, set up all across the parking lot and everything. And, and then we've had some pretty big names out there. I think uh, last year we had Neil Peart's drum set set up and, and uh, we typically have like a wall of Marshall amps. So just a lot of fun stuff. The event's free and uh, there'll probably be some more information coming on Sweetwater's side if you're in the, in the States to check it out. So I told many people about our tour and just told them how cool it was, including our sound engineer here at JMU, Tom Carr. And I think I think he even called it. I said, so I just saw a really cool 
music facility in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he went, "Oh, Sweetwater." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he just just knew right away. But um, yeah, we talked a little bit about that on the podcast before. Tell us, t- tell us just real quick, like what's the coolest thing about working at Sweetwater? Um, wow, well, I would once again, I would just say, as far as you know, we're only in one location in Fort Wayne, uh, so you know, not too many people who have experienced our business have been to our facility because we we operate on a national scale on one location though. Um, But I will say still probably the coolest part about it is uh, working with the people that I get to work with. Um, Not only the sales, the sales engineers there, which are about 300 at this point, um, you know, they're obviously all experts and really dedicated, uh, a lot of different personalities, a lot of fun to talk to you. But I would say that extends to the entire company, uh, whether it's, you know, the distribution center employees who will go above and beyond to like help a, a local customer get, you know, packages, things like that. Or if it's the marketing team or I mean, really everybody there shares a passion for uh, greatness and really just always being innovative, always changing to make something better. Um, which I definitely think is is help keep us current, um, but still keeping that core of the uh, excellent customer service that I think a lot of people know know us for. Do you think Sweetwater would endorse the Ep Percussion podcast? <laughs> we, you know, we don't make it, any money, and my, <laughs> and my colleagues are sick of it. I will say that that uh, Chuck Serac, the founder is very, very big in the community as far as supporting music and the arts. And I definitely know he's donated to a lot of local things. Um, but I don't know. I'll, I'll move it up the chain and see what we can see. What we can do. <laughs> I know for yeah, a fact. One of my favorite things about the campus, as you say, at Sweetwater was the, the theater for, you know, obvious mm-hmm. reasons. But I loved that it was so um, available to members of the community. I thought, Absolutely. I think that's so cool. Right. Is it free to check to rent it? Yeah. So from what I understand, we have a, a nice small 300 person theater, which we typically during the week use for sales meetings and things. Um, but yeah, if you're a community member, um, you can uh, easily uh, rent it for recitals things. You just have to I think they just have to pay for tech people to be there. But it's constantly used for our, our local music academy, which we have tons of people uh, in the music academy who teach local lessons. So they, they have concerts there. Uh, recently, we had a, a pretty cool NPR event. Uh, there and so yeah it's just various concerts things like that and um, just a really great space that they use great hey Ben do you have something for Micah there yeah so we just like I said finished our semester here and I've taught percussion methods before but I've never taught percussion methods like here because my percussion methods class had 32 students in it. Whoa! (laughs) Everything's bigger in Texas. (laughs) Um, And so, uh, and it was also, when I last taught this class, it was like a 50-minute class, and now it's an hour and a half. So it's been quite a challenge for me to just figure out how to teach a class so large. Um, And we had a Facebook question from Chase Neely that I thought was pertinent to that from Micah. And it says, what are some things that you discovered as an educator that you wish you had would have been better prepared for as a student have you noticed a trend among first-year teachers' deficiencies? What could colleges do to better prepare their students for the workforce? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, a really great question. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, the first thing that I'd say that I've discovered that is different and hard to prepare for is just your classroom management skills, and especially how they're varied in a music setting versus a uh, traditional classroom because for for most of my classes when I'm doing my percussion class then I'm in a smaller setting Um, so that's very different than a traditional setting but um, for band settings like we have a sixth grade band usually that has a hundred kids in it Um, so that's I mean it's not a huge sixth grade band but that's a significant size to have sixth graders in one room all trying to make noise together Um, so do they do they have it as like percussion class or is it all beginning band all the time? Well, the way we do it, and this is actually there was another question about doing scheduling. We are super fortunate. Um, the way it's structured at Northridge, we have um, three directors, and one's the full time middle school director, one's the full time high school director, and then there's me that I basically only do percussion and maybe occasional sectional work with other things in the band, but we've got it set up so that we can all be there for everything. 
So most of the time what we do is we split into sectionals. So the high school director, especially for the middle school, will take the brass, the middle or the middle school director will take the woodwinds and I'll take the percussionists. And I think that's probably how we spend 80% or more of our time where I just get to have percussion class. But um, overall, yeah, classroom management is a huge, um, huge pain kind of. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's, it's really difficult to figure out how you're going to, um, try to deal with the one kid that's on the far side of the room who's making a lot of noise, right? And it might be something where he just wants to ask like 30 or he or she wants to ask like tons and tons of questions, uh, but they're just not at all pertinent to what you're doing. And you're just trying to get through what you're doing in class. It might be something like that where it's actually like an over-enthusiasm problem, or it could be that there's a kid that is on their phone, chewing gum, like turned around, talking to their friend. And you have to figure out how you're gonna manage that one student while at the same time keeping the entire class going in the right direction. And so I think classroom management is was my biggest efficiency. And it's probably easiest for me to speak for myself because I haven't done a ton of observation of other first year teachers, unfortunately. That's not really something that you get an opportunity to do. When you are student teaching, you're watching like really experienced teachers and yeah, so it's just very yeah. different. Experience. When I was, I think when that's I was fair student, to say. I, I, oh, when sorry, I was student ben. teaching at a middle school, I loved it. Like when all the kids would be like hacking with teachers, say, "Put your sticks in armpit jail," and all the kids would like put their sticks under their arms. <laughs> <laughs> and I yeah. use that with my college percussion methods class. <laughs> oh, that's that's really good. I should, I should try that out. We did a, a monkey rest thing at one point where the kids had to put their sticks like on top of their head and then puff out their cheeks. Like that, but um, and that was fairly effective because it made them be quiet too. They couldn't talk, but it kind of only works for the youngest sixth graders. <laughs> so just just Wait. funny coincidence that this came up. But my uh, my father, you guys know him as a mathematician, but he also has a book called Classroom Management Strategies. I just sent you mm-hmm. all a link in the chat. That's um, sweet. So it's he. God, I'm, I'm gonna get. Are this we getting wrong. royalties because you're plugging this? I better, <laughs> yeah, I damn right. He, um, I, I know my mom used the book for a long while in her classes, and this was one of the classes that you'd hear. Everyone always said they liked the course, but the notion of the course, I know my music ed peers would say, like, oh, and I got to take this course on music, uh, you know, sorry, classroom management, and oh man, it's a pain. So it's great to hear. Micah say no this is like that was the the place that needs to be focused and, on more and, that was <laughs> and, they, and they did end up liking the class but they always yeah. Kind of yeah. said like oh but man it's tough that was gotta... totally me in college it was what like I was I was definitely the one that was like I do not like this classroom management stuff like right. it was a, a lot of it stemmed from the fact that I think we had this book called teach like a champion yeah. which in uh, retrospect is like a, a pretty good and valuable guide but it kind of like lays out like here are the magical techniques that if you use these you'll be an effective teacher that's the way i felt about it at least but i just hated that because it wasn't operating at all on a conceptual level and was just like it it just didn't feel like it was um intellectual enough for me or something i don't know but in retrospect it would be very valuable and i should probably flip through it a couple times and check out the different techniques that that guy advocates for Take a lot of education. Oh, sorry, Christian, go ahead. I was just going to mention, I mean, I, I took a lot of those courses alongside Micah. Mm-hmm. And I'm, while I've never actually been a uh, you know certified public school teacher like he was, definitely have done quite a bit of after school ensemble with many different percussion groups and things like that. And I would just say, I mean, there are so many other factors that it's really hard to take into consideration, um, you know, such as, for example, the time of year when it gets nice outside, kids like to become quite a bit more antsy, right? They want to be outside to play. Or, you know, did they just get back from lunch or all these other things that you really are out of your control. So, I mean, you got to take it with a grain of salt as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It, it seems like so much of whether this goes well or not is the teacher's personality. It, yeah. You know, I mean, so much of it is, you know, regardless of how prepared you are, how many tricks and tactics you know, you just got to have the right mentality and just, you know, a way about you, as they say, right? <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I, I point to one of my colleagues, Bryce Cohn, the middle school band director, as just being 
phenomenal in that regard. Like he is the perfect middle school band director. He just does a fantastic job with it. And um, yeah, so I've, I've learned a lot from just watching him, which has been great because I get to keep doing it all the time. It's not a placement that I'm in for one semester and then move on. So I get to, it's been good for me to keep learning about those classroom management skills from him because he's great. And Christian actually, yeah. he was his middle school director. So yeah, when I actually way back in the heyday, you know, when I was in sixth grade, that was actually uh, Bryce Cohn's first year there. And um, yeah, I can absolutely attest to it. Uh, he just has, you know, as middle schoolers, uh, they're they're really even between the sixth through eighth, all kind of in a different stage. I mean, even in the same grade, they're all just very different. And so definitely he has a certain authenticity about him and the way uh, he approaches the students that just makes makes them, you know, uh, you know, he doesn't certainly doesn't talk down to them at the same time. It's not like he's talking up. I mean, he's just very, very approachable teacher, uh, really fun guy. Um, you know, like likes a lot of the same uh, nerdy stuff that band kids love. And uh, I think that's what definitely uh, I think that definitely has a huge uh, contribution to Northridge's uh, retention rates, which right now they're seeing quite a big, yeah. quite a few larger high school class yeah, sizes as well. We're one of the few schools that I can think of that's growing um, in a band program, at least where, around where we are. We're one of the few ones that's growing. So it's really in large part because, well, well both the other band directors are fantastic, but um, just being that engaged in middle school band helps them, I think, to want to make that transition because that's where you lose a lot of kids between eighth and freshman year. So, yeah. Sure, sure. Well, yeah. it was very clear to Laurel and I when we just saw how you work with them in Indiana there at the, the convention that's like, oh, yeah, this is oh, clearly, yeah. A, clearly a good program. Yeah. Huh. Well, and it's a thing that you like because I, I haven't been in front of a big group of high schoolers in some time, but like when I was in undergrad, I teched all these drum lines and I would teach – I think this was actually highly illegal because I was not certified, but there was a percussion class and I taught <laughs> it as a student in college. So I think that's like actually really bad and should and never you, have happened. And you sold them smokes. <laughs> uh huh. Also highly illegal. Um, yeah, also highly illegal. Yeah, but I just, I remember there being like 27 kids in there and just being like, oh, oh you know, but you get, like you get used to it, but then. Like I was, I was a nerdy good student, so I like didn't have the perspective of being a troublemaker, you know. So I didn't know what would work. Like someone just had to give me a nasty side eye, and I quit whatever I was doing if I was doing anything, you know. It takes um, one to know one. That's why I. Can, I guess so. That's why I can. I guess so. One. Yeah, but I, I will <laughs> just say I'm very encouraged by, uh, at least here at JMU, the number of students we get coming in to our studio that want to be directors at middle school and high schools it's like it's a lot and they're really excited about it and they really want to do it and it's it's so nice to see because at least i recall many people treating that like a backup plan and i always felt that that was a problem right um, yeah, it's john, not the easy john parks choice. has a great blog entry about that he wrote a couple months ago mm. um and yeah, there's enough. Uh, I'm not saying this to indicate a majority, but there are plenty of terrible middle school band directors that we don't need more bad middle school band directors. There are also plenty of very good ones. I'm not saying that like the majority is or anything like that. Oh, exactly. Yeah, and I would guess that the directors you guys have mentioned um, that are so good at the middle school are the people that Casey and I see that come in and are excited and want to do it. And yeah. Totally. I think that's a, a huge part of whether or not you're going to be successful as a music educator is whether or not you care about about making music and doing it at a high level. I think that's really important. Oh, yeah, exactly. We have one um, one student in particular who might just um, she's just totally blossomed. She'll be a sophomore next year, but she's mm -hmm. quickly become one of the like, really like authentic performers in the studio. Casey knows who I'm talking about. Um, yeah, she just went from being like, I don't need to be very good because I'm a music ed major to just like, I don't know what happened, but <laughs> something awesome. happened. Cool. And, well, and she's excited about both. She's like, I really yeah. want to be a good player and I'm so excited about teaching and about they're related. And yeah, there's none of this. One is an excuse for laziness of the other. There's just like none of that. It's so nice. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, you are a person that I want teaching music for yeah. sure. Yeah. 
Well, and I think I, that like uh, good musicianship in any sense is sort of like universal. Like you can't be uh, just a, an amazing conductor and teacher, and but you were completely terrible at the trumpet. Like you have to know <laughs> what it takes to be good at an instrument yeah. to be a good teacher. Um, but then also, in Casey's pointed out before that middle school band teaching is so much more difficult than what we do as college teachers, because <laughs> I just kind of talk about what I know about, like what I've already done for years. Like I can't imagine having to teach flute and clarinet and trumpet and, you know, violin and choir, or whatever else comes up. Yeah. 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 What do you got there, Laurel? Yeah. Uh, we got a Facebook question from Rodney Rote Jr. Uh, what are your thoughts and tips on building a stronger percussion program for students, especially in the smaller schools? How do you start a percussion ensemble for enthusiastic students and keep their commitment? And he goes on to explain what he's getting at more specifically is the ways you recruit students to play in ensembles at a smaller school where numbers are limited. Um, and there's whether or not they're beginners or experienced. So if you'll just talk yeah. about that, building a strong program at a small school, keeping them enthusiastic. Well, I'll just quickly before Micah goes off here and say the number one thing, uh, because as certainly the, the smaller the school, the number of activities remain the same. Students often have to do quite a bit. And I can definitely say uh, I've, that's the case at Northridge. I still have two younger brothers in that system. Uh, probably the biggest thing, and Micah just had experience with this, is a uh, show choir is the is the second biggest thing to marching band here in indiana uh and very competitive show choir and yeah. so a lot of kids have these have many different hands and not only the academics but extracurricular so you yeah. jump right in yeah yeah can, so <laughs> so it's i i came from northridge has about 1400 students the school i teach at but i i went to a school of 400 high school students um so only about 100 in class which means which meant that basically everyone, if you wanted to do an activity, then you were a super valuable commodity and anyone would make accommodations to get you there, right? So I would do marching band and play tennis at the same time in the same season or I was doing, you know, the spring musical and also was on the golf team and doing winter percussion. And so like bouncing around and doing all those things. So um, one thing I would say um, as far as recruiting goes is like, if kids want to do it, like don't don't say no to them initially. Like if, if especially if they're coming to you and asking to do it, like try to meet them where they're at and let them in. Because um, I actually did do show choir, Ben. That was also on the list. Um, yeah, you thought sorry, you'd sneak that by, huh, Ben? Yeah, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, Not, it was. Very I did it too. I did it too. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I was in everything. But um, yeah, just like if, if kids are interested, then and especially if they're approaching you about it, that means that they're probably going to be more enthusiastic and more ready to go on that stuff. So they'll um, they're more likely to stick with it and be committed if they're going for that. If you're going around and recruiting and trying to get kids to do something, especially if you're like really like twisting arms and pulling teeth to get kids there, those kids aren't going to want to be there. And then it's just going to make a bad time for everyone, right? I, what Christian was alluding to earlier is I was the uh, – in Indiana, there are show choir bands that back up the show choir. So you play a custom arrangement that's usually um, way out of a high schooler's league and try to make that sound good. But um, I, I kind of had that experience where I was really trying to, um, to get these kids – that didn't necessarily want to be there to show up to practice and work hard for sometimes two or three hours because the show choir rehearses so much. Um, and it, that was really tough. And I actually had one kid quit at the semester and I was just like, that's fine. <laughs> See ya. Like, cause the attitude of the group improved so much. So if there, right. if there are kids there that just don't want to be there, then they're probably holding everybody else back. That's the other thing about recruiting. And I know when you're trying to, boost numbers because that's how my program always was in high school we were always trying to get more people um we always needed more people to do the things that we were doing with marching band and everything else um so then that can be hard to say no or to let a kid quit but i think that that uh, sometimes that's necessary too uh, does that make sense yeah and, and overall I, 
coming from personal experience myself. So, I mean, going once again way back, I definitely always knew, uh, coming from a musical family, I personally knew I wanted to be a drummer, definitely wanted to be a percussionist. We went around, and I'm sure like many school corporations do, they go around to the fifth grade classrooms and the fifth grade schools, and they have kids just, you know, blow on a trumpet for a little bit or try out a drum pad, and then they give you this little slip of paper when they write down what you're going to be good at. And, you know, uh, I think on mine, I ended up getting like a trombone or something, and I kind of came home devastated. And fortunately, my parents, you know, called the school and they were like, hey, is there any way that you could do percussion? And the band director, uh, who was the one right before Mr. Cone came, was like, well, of course, you know, because they just were trying to fill certain quotas of numbers and things like that. But, you know, I would say, especially, it gets a little trickier once your student has established interests, but exactly what Micah said, where if, if the kids are enjoying it, you know, that's great. If there's a kid you see who, regardless of how talented they may or may not be, if they're not enjoying it, um, that's something that you got to look at. And ultimately, you know, I think it works out in many ensembles for the betterment of the group to let those people pursue what they, what they choose to pursue. Mm -hmm. So did uh, both, obviously both you guys grew up in Indiana, went through the school system. Is it common there to have a percussion teacher specifically? No, no. Uh, no it's okay. <laughs> it's it's okay. Um, super fortunate. I was actually wondering from all of you, did you guys have percussion teachers in high school, like in your high school doing a full-time job? No. No, we had a no. percussion hour, like we had an hour dedicated for us. And yeah, the idea is we'd rehearse our music, uh, you know, the same piece as the band was playing and we do percussion ensemble. Okay. And it, it was our band director. I mean, it, it was, he was great, you know. Yeah. It was, it was definitely not common to have any sort of, um, percussion director or instructor that was paid by the school system. Oftentimes the band booster organization had a third yeah. party uh, person who like, that's how I was hired through Goshen schools and many other school corporations or many other schools in the Northeast, uh, North, Northern Indiana area to come in and work here and there. But yeah, to have a, have somebody there during the day, uh, especially to, to be honest, even at, even at Northridge, which is 1400 students to have a person like Micah there is, is pretty uncommon. I would say you are starting to see more of that though, which is a really great thing. Um, right down the road, we have Concord high school. Um, that's, uh, I don't know if any of you know, Ben or uncle. Yeah. At all. Yeah. He's a Apex Majestic guy. So yeah. he's, yeah, he's at Concord, which is right down the road from us. And I mean, to have two, two schools in the same county, especially a somewhat more rural county like Elkhart, which is where we are, is pretty big. But it, it's kind of, kind of cool because in a lot of ways, Elkhart County has kind of developed into the uh, uh, secondary percussion, uh, yeah. like, place in Indiana. Indy still has the advantage, but Elkhart's, Elkhart's uh, coming up in terms of the just overall percussive excellence, which is awesome. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So something struck me just listening to NPR this week, and it's of course switching gears quite a bit, but uh, <laughs> it'd, it'd be great to hear everyone's just thoughts and opinions on this, and uh, hopefully it doesn't go on too long as some of mine often do. So the title on this NPR article is On College Campuses, Outrage Over Provocative Speakers Sometimes Turns Violent. So the, the interview continues and says, it's becoming a pattern on campuses around the country. A speaker is invited, often by a conservative student group. Other students oppose the speaker, and maybe they protest. If the speech happens, the speaker is heckled. Sometimes there is violence. In other cases, as with a recent one, conservative commentator Ann Coulter at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, a week ago, was uh, this was called off. And we've, se we've seen those before. So uh, that's the second one at UC Berkeley, I believe, where the speaker's coming, the students protest, and they run amok. And in some cases, yeah, they get violent, and they cancel the event entirely. So now a handful of states, including Illinois, Tennessee, Colorado, and Arizona, have passed or introduced legislation designed to prevent these incidents from happening. The model bill would require public universities to remain neutral on political issues, prevent them from disinviting speakers, and impose penalties for students and others who interfere with these speakers. Attorney Jim Manley, who co-wrote the bill, says the institutional neutrality provision serves as a reminder to public universities that they are funded by taxpayers who shouldn't be forced to subsidize speech that they disagree with. He says the other provisions 
are important because the students who have engaged in these protests have not been adequately disciplined by the universities. So I took a look at one of these bills because there was one they mentioned, and it's called House Bill 527 for North Carolina. And you can find this. It's uh, www.ncleg.net, Sessions 2017 Bills House. Uh, you, you'll find it very easily if you Google it. And actually, it's not that hard to read. I was really nervous it would be so much legal jargon I wouldn't be able to understand it, but it's actually quite easy to read. And the title of it, at the top of the uh, still-to-be-named bill, says, An Act to Restore and Preserve Free Speech on the Campus of the Constituent Institutions of the University of North Carolina. And I did read the whole thing. It's about two and a half pages, and the points are drawn out pretty clearly and just numbered. And it opens with a couple of whereas statements where they say, we acknowledge that free speech is really important and that the First Amendment is great and we support this and believe that's a big part of what universities hold dear and hold valuable and it's a big part of the goodness of academia. And then they quote a couple of other universities that have supposedly made similar declarations about free speech. One is from Yale, and it's called the Woodward Report. Another one was the University of Chicago. And there are a couple others, and they're basically saying, look, see, other universities do this too, and they say they really care about free speech. So I guess a question for you guys to get everyone talking, do you see those protests as a violation of free speech? Because that's what they're saying. They're saying... These protests are stopping the event from happening, and by the university disinviting the person or canceling the speech, people like Ann Coulter and a guy whose name I don't even want to repeat because it'll give him Thank you. publicity. <laughs> but um, they they want to they want to come and and do these things, and then they get canceled or whatever, and they say this is a violation of my free speech. These guys are silencing me. And so, yeah, that, I guess that's the first question. Is that a violation of their free speech? I'll bite. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so I, I, I was trying to think of, like, how to explain this. And, like, to me, like, I think if you just take it to the extreme and, like, can you imagine if a college campus invited Charles Manson to be a featured speaker? Um, obviously, the guy's, you know, well, he's in prison, but that, so that's probably a bad example. But, like, the guy is welcome to come and speak, at, you know, in an invited context and in an auditorium or whatever. Um, but if such a thing happened, there would be massive protests uh, to the point that the university would probably feel pressure from their own constituents, so to speak, to disinvite that person. Um, so I think it's the protesters right to free speech to say that we don't want to listen to this person talk and then the university at that point can disinvite them. That being said, if someone is invited and there are protests, I don't think that there should be, uh, I think they should still be able to get physical access to the building and, you know, be brought into a quiet auditorium to speak. So, to, you know, go on. So, yeah, I think that's reasonable to protest. That's free speech. But also if the person still wants to come in spite of the protests, like I can't imagine Ann Coulter at UC Berkeley, um, then that's, you know, welcome as well. Yeah. Well, the, the issue is that the university said don't come, right? Because it's going to be such a nasty environment. I is mean, that what happened? The, yeah, that's the complaint, I think. They're either saying what Ben just said of, of saying, oh, this is such bad press and this has turned into a mess, mm. so let's just cancel the event entirely. Or, like in the case of uh, UC Berkeley, at one of their protests, it got violent. And they said, okay, well, having this event is dangerous. Let's just not have it, have it at all. We, so, and of we course, had I think... We're all in agreement there. Like nobody wants that to happen. But the the question is, what are the students protected against, and what are they not? So, sorry, Ben, what were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say we had we had a bizarre situation at FAU when I taught there, where the stadium they built a new stadium probably about eleven years ago at FAU, um, and it's it's one of the nicest college stadiums I've ever seen, and so it's very expensive. So oftentimes, what they do is they put up a bid for naming rights to a stadium. And this was featured on, I think, Colbert Report. 
um, that this group called the GEO Group wanted to bid for the naming rights to the stadium. Well, the GEO Group is a for-profit prison group. <laughs> um, and several people have died under their, I guess, lack of policies, you could say, um, as for-profit prisons. So there was this huge outrage over it on campus. All the students protested, and eventually the university withdrew the, you know, whatever to have it named as GEO Group Stadium. Um, and I mean, during this, the president of the university was actually like speeding off campus through a protest and like hit a student with her car. Not oh seriously, God. but like that actually happened. Um, and the president actually resigned, I think, over the whole stink over that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, when you take it to the extremes, like a, if you had Charles Manson as a featured speaker, you're naming your stadium after the GEO group, then, yeah, I think a protest is completely reasonable and you know, the university, either the administration has to either suck it up and say, well, we want to be associated with this terrible person or organization, or they can say, you know what, on second thought, we're going to not do that. Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Micah or Christian? I have well, some more stuff to say, but I, I, to... I thought upon reading the article, I thought it kind of seemed like part of the issue was that um, it was a like an on-campus group that was doing the inviting, but then it was the university that was shutting it down. Right. Mm -hmm. So, if, well, so, if it was so it's, so yeah, you're right. It's the, a, a portion of the university is inviting it like a student group. Yeah. Uh, which of course has, I know the student groups tend to have to have a faculty supporter. So you could argue that any student group also has some type of faculty signature that approves or reviews or whatever. Mm -hmm. Typically, I'm sure there are different mm -hmm. types of student groups, but yeah, so it's some portion of the university wants this group. And, of course, what the, the House bill is saying is we want free speech for everyone. And these viewpoints that do attract protest, of course, are unpopular viewpoints. And that's what free speech is supposed to do is protect unpopular viewpoints. We don't really need any help protecting popular viewpoints. Those are fine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're exactly right. Like the university basically they see what little what this little group did is causing a big stink and they say okay never mind we we now yeah. want to say you can yeah i think if it were like a if there were both top down decisions like the um, somebody in the administration or the administration was inviting these speakers and then the administration was canceling it that might be um, seen a little bit differently but since it's right. one group of students um, supposedly preventing free speech of another group of students by inviting that speaker, then that would be seen problematic. Yeah. I, would, I would say overall, the thing that Ben definitely highlighted on is uh, the, the number one th most important thing in public education in my mind is safety. Um, so, if, I mean, of course, if there's a, a point at which it is not safe for the speaker to come, I think that is certainly um, very unfortunate that, you know, somebody's not able to, to you know, regardless of what their views are, share their opinion based off of whether or not they feel safe. Uh, I definitely think, you know, in today's world, college campuses are one of the last remaining areas. I mean, not so much anymore as we're talking about, that you can actually have those discussions and, and voice opinions. Yeah. I do think it is, you know, tricky once you, once in case you mentioned, you know, faculty signing off as far as, is it, is it a student group? Is it a, you know, college decision? Um, overall, I would say, I would hope that everybody who's coming to a college campus to speak would be for the betterment of some form of education. Once again, regardless of if you believe in that education or not, but going back to your uh, example, Ben, of you know Charles Manson, I'm, I'm sure there would be outrage if somebody brought those in. I'm also sure that many of the uh, college's uh, psychology professors would attend that <laughs> lecture. Um, yeah, right. So, you, know, you know, thinking about that, but overall I would say safety still remains the number one most important thing uh, and I think I think it's important that everyone feels safe, uh, and hopefully that that still leads to free speech. You know? Yeah. Well, I don't like the. I mean, I get I always get caught up on words and the language that people use, but it's it's like not against your free speech. No, you can make the same speech and like Skype it in to that group mm -hmm. of students. You can still do that. There's nothing saying you can't do that. You well, just and aren't coming to the school to do it in person and you get to say those words regardless so it's not free speech that is being quote-unquote violated in this it's something else yeah well and that's the um the thing I, that it, this all really led me to look into so the whole bill and the whole point is all based around 
the betterment and the the upholding of the First Amendment, okay, which is the 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 right for free speech. So um, I just did a little more digging, and yeah, the answer is no. When when you kick someone out of your house for what they're saying, you're not um, you're not infringing on their free speech. If you if the police arrest them for what they're saying, and their and specifically their political opinion, that's all the First Amendment protects you from. It just protects you against arrest and prosecution. So so here's just a couple of points. The primary reasons for the First Amendment are the allowance for public criticism of the government, freedom of the press, and religion. This protects you from the government doing things to impede your speech, but not anyone else. And this is the part that says Congress shall make no law. Uh, political speech is given the strongest level of protection. This is called preferred position. And this was, um, I, I guess, really solidified in something called Brandenburg versus Ohio, 1968, where a guy from the KKK was making a big public speech, which was, of course, scary and and really offensive and all these things. So you can advocate to overthrow the government, commit violence, not pay taxes, etc., so long as you're not immediately inciting violence. Uh, let's see, going on, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who is an associate justice of the Supreme Court, ruled that a person's speech can be amended if said speech poses a clear and present danger. He is the one who famously said the words that the First Amendment does not protect against a person shouting fire in a crowded movie theater. Let's see, the U.S. versus Schenck in 1917. Schenck distributed pamphlets encouraging people to avoid the draft. So you'd think, okay, that is a definite violation of his free speech. He's protesting the government. He's saying he doesn't agree with a certain government act and policy. And he's distributing these pamphlets, and they say that is not protected because at the time <laughs> it was violating something called the Espionage Act which made it a crime to obstruct the draft or anything to do with the war effort. So in that case, free speech, you don't, you don't get it <laughs> because there's this it. other pressing issue. Uh -oh. um, one thing they could do, fight words are protected. So, oh, excuse me, fight words are not protected not. by the First Amendment, I worded that backwards. So if you are saying something that is not making a point, you are just trying to antagonize and provoke, which it seems people do all the time, mm -hmm. they can, yeah. yeah, there have been rulings where, yeah, you, you can't do that. So, um, and that's one it sounds like they pull out very rarely. So yeah, basically these guys saying, I, I agree with you guys. I think it's wrong. I think anyone should be able to come. Anyone should be able to speak freely. I don't think the students at UC Berkeley were right to start breaking windows and burning dumpsters and stuff like that. That's ridiculous. But the crime they're committing there is not an infringement of free speech. It's um, like vandalism. assault yeah. and <laughs> vandalism. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and it's very simple. If the, um, if the Westboro Baptist Church shows up to protest a funeral... And they're free to do that on the public sidewalk. That's a public area. But the quad at JMU is not the same kind of public space. And if the Westboro Baptist Church were to follow pe the people into the, um, you know, the church where the funeral is happening or the cemetery is happening, and the coordinators and organizers of the cemetery say, hey, no, you have to leave, and they don't, they're trespassing because that public space is not the same kind of public space as a public sidewalk or a public park, just like the quad on a campus is not the same type of public space. Mm -hmm. So I think the word free speech is being way abused, and I also think the word public is getting confused. And, and likewise, just like um, I can't go to Tarleton, Ben's school, and just go attend classes. It's a public institution. I'm a member of the public. I'm a tax player, payer, but I'm not allowed to just go sit in on a class. They can yeah, tell we only we only allow Laurel here. You're not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and likewise, you know, a, a family who wants to um, barbecue like they would at a public park, if if a campus tells them, hey, you're barbecuing on our quad, that's not what the quad is for. You need to please leave. And they don't leave. Um, it's it's now trespassing. So 
I yeah, certainly the word public, you'd, uh, I think, is... Sorry? I certainly, oh, I, I was going to say, I certainly think you had, you know, there's definitely a valid point in, especially public institution, that those are, you know, taxpayer dollars helping fund that, which is definitely a great thing. Uh, you know, definitely think the other side, like you pointed out, is to remember also the many, many students who spend still, you know, burden the cost of thousands of dollars yeah. to choose that university, to attend that university. I certainly can see the side to be, you know, upset that, um, you know, some of your funding may be going towards supporting somebody who you don't agree with. But at the same mm -hmm. time, once again, I still think that that's one of the last college campuses in America are one of the last places people can still freely, uh, mm -hmm. you know, voice their opinion and, and hear and have that right, which is very cool. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think we all agree. I mean, and I completely agree with that, and I think that's well said. So, I mean, I think basically this new legislation is not needed. They just need to, yeah. they just need, the free speech has already thoroughly covered this, and yeah. the interpretations of the First Amendment have already gone back and forth with this many times. And all they're doing is they're trying to make a new law rather than <laughs> figure out how to work with the, within the First Amendment that's already established and actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think what's happening is exactly what should happen. These people should be invited. They should be allowed to speak. And people should be allowed to protest just so long mm -hmm. as they don't commit other, other crimes. And the police do what they're supposed to do, which is let yep. each side sit there and yell at each other, make sure nobody commits any crimes, and that's it. Cool. Well, and the issue is, I mean, there's been such a well, a separate yet connected issue is the kind of the decline of, especially within the world of politics, of the discourse and how people talk to each other. Like I've seen in the debates and like so much yeah. of at least what I hear in some of the people claiming free speech infringement, like, yeah, free speech, but you're also just bullying people. Yeah. And I guess you are free to do that, but don't be upset then when groups of people start to stand up against you. And, right. Well, and that's Yeah, and tell you that say, that's not okay and and yeah, like that's, a, that's another thing they say you're not allowed to offend anyone. And and they say I want to come and say provocative and offensive things and I need to be allowed to do that. It's like, "Hey, yeah, well that's what provocative and offensive means is you're going to carry a little shit storm with it you know that's exactly what it is if you you know if you don't have some people protesting then guess what what you're saying is not very offensive or provocative yeah i think the long story short here is there's there's no such thing as free speech without consequences it's just free speech without government persecution <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, the only reason I, I highlight it is often <laughs> things I bring up on the podcast is I just hate the, the wrongful use of the term. You know, mm. like my free speech is being violated. No, it's not. You're not being arrested. You're not. <laughs> it, it only says no law shall be made to infringe upon whatever you want to say and especially in political things. So yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll also cite what are called speech codes. Campuses often have speech codes, and they'll say, oh, that sounds like they're trying to censor what the students are saying. But if you look up speech codes, they mostly involve things that uh, protect students against sexual harassment, and they protect obscene language being posted on flyers. And you could easily say, well, I have every right to, to – draw that on a flyer or write that on a flyer. It's like, no, I, I, that's what these speech codes are for. We, we want this public institution to feel comfortable and we don't need the students walking by the walls and seeing um, obscene drawings on the flyers. So it's not about your political views. It's much more about um, displaying things like uh, sexual images and alcohol so that yeah. the students simply feel safe. Yeah. Well, I do think some of this can be abused by professors. Like, you know, during election season, I had so many students come up to me and tell me, you are the only professor that has not talked about politics in class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, like, and I didn't, I talked extensively on the importance of voting and told them where they could go vote. And I explained that your vote is your vote. It is not your parents' vote. It is not your overactive boyfriend's vote. It is your vote. And yeah, so I, I feel like it, it can go a little bit of both ways here. In ter I think professors should also notice, like, you're in a position of power and don't bully them into 
your point of view. Don't play yeah. students. And, yeah. and once again, well, I think I, I definitely think discussion is a great thing, and especially with politics, there's quite a bit of discussion. But once again, I mean, we're we're all educators here, right? Our goal is to to teach our subjects respectively. If you're teaching politics one on one or whatever, absolutely, I'd be, in fact, probably upset if I didn't, you know, if my kid or child said that they want to talk about elections or politics in that class. But when it comes to music stuff, uh, especially, it's like, listen, I'm here to teach music and hopefully provide just a break from not only that, but everything else going on in your life um, in, in a positive space. Yeah. yeah. I also think you don't win anybody by doing that. You know, by, yeah, by ranting in front of your classroom, I don't think you win anybody over. I think you, I think you can win people over to your point of view, but it is a much more patient process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. How about another like Facebook? like when um, Casey starts talking about Steven Scrip and studio class, I make him stop because I want to take away his freedom of speech. It's almost right. as bad as when Casey starts talking about Game of Thrones. Yeah. Oh, that's the worst. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's the worst ever. When's the new season coming out? Oh God. Mid July. <laughs> Good job. Good job, Micah. Um, July, Ben. Great. Yeah, great. Aren't you excited? We still have Can't that wait Game to of Thrones podcast, come back again. percussion podcast loaded up after release. <laughs> Switching gears, Tyrus Tucker, what is an efficient way of getting a program of students to be more well-rounded in just a day-to-day -day class setting? Yeah, Tyrus. Tyrus is uh, a student at Goshen College now, where we both graduated from. He's he's the new percussion student. Yeah, the we, the one. Uh, we both so, college, too, so. <laughs> so it was good to see a question from Tyrus. Um, for me, what what I focus on. Well, I know I can't do everything. Um, there's there's just no way to get it to the point where um, we could have. I, I at least where we're at, where I'm at right now. I can't have. Uh, like a steel pan ensemble and also do uh, like um, a, a Ghanaian drumming thing and also do marching band and also do our Western percussion ensemble and also be with the band and also do the, all this stuff. Um, so it, like I have kind of accepted that and decided that it's just kind of the most important thing for me to do is focus on the basics um, in a lot of ways, especially in my middle school classes. Um, I try to just really dig into um, technique in a lot of ways. We, I make sure that those students are getting their daily technique in um, during our class because I know that it's hard to go home and practice that stuff. So we do a lot of technique work in middle school, a lot of sight reading in middle school, so I can really build those skills um, so that when they get to high school and they have less time to do that stuff, in class because we're working on bigger pieces um we can focus more on the musical side of things so um i think yeah just just really making sure that they're solid at the basic things being able to play with good technique and have decent chops i do chop work in like sixth grade i get them started trying to trying to get their hand speed up um so that they can eventually reach that high level stuff um just so that eventually yeah they're playing Ritual music, you know, right. playing, playing that harder stuff. Because, yeah. um, like, a lot of those pieces just, I mean, there's a certain level of technique that they demand, and then the, the musicality will follow it as they get older. Yeah, so, I'll, I mean, very from the very beginning in sixth grade, it's very broken down into, you know, you got your kit with your practice pad and your bell kit, right? I mean, it's very drumming or mountain-oriented to start out with. Um, and so I would say certainly students gravitate to one or the other. I know I gravitated more to drumming and I think Mike did more in high school. And then when we both got, uh, when I was actually, when I was in high school and when Mike got into college, we definitely moved more towards the keyboard side, but, mm -hmm. but still keeping a good balance. I think it's just doing a lot of smart things such as, you know, uh, understanding if someone you know, for example, you know, it's it's common sense that you would say, oh, hey, this person played snare drum in Marching Band in the fall. He's going to play snare drum on this concert band piece, right? Mm -hmm. And that might be the best thing to make it sound the best. At the same time, as an educator, you have to look and say, hey, you know, can I give this kid a mallet piece to, to really further that growth in ways? Um, yeah. One of the things we did at Goshen as far as the WGI scene, uh, we had quite a few. So my first year starting teaching there with Derek Channing was 2013. We had a lot of younger kids in the front ensemble who that next year moved to the to the battery uh, in the winter. And we said, you know, we really want to continue this 
you know, phenomenal front ensemble growth that we saw. So we, we had a secondary concert group that, you know, you, it was an option to be in both. Um, it wasn't required, but it was a way for the battery kids to continue to develop those front ensemble chops uh, overall and really just, you know, showing your kids that you have a passion for both, I think definitely helps them sure. realize that it's necessary for both. For sure. Mm, yeah. Great. I, I feel like, I, I don't know, when I, like Christian was right, when I was in high school, I played marching snare drum. That's what I played. Like, and I was not at a high level with uh, marimba chops at all. I was playing like uh, rain dance and yellow after the rain were like the two <laughs> solos I played in high school. So I, I just didn't have that experience at all. And it's because I wasn't pushed into it, right? I started playing snare drum in sixth grade and I got every snare drum part on every piece until I graduated. Yeah. And I just didn't get any better at playing mallet stuff because I wasn't assigned mallet stuff. So I try to really make a conscious effort um, to assign parts in a diverse way to, uh, and not just in full band setting, but also when we're doing our percussion ensemble um, setup. And yeah, I also try in, um, oh, sorry, my doorbell's ringing real quick. Um, you know, That's right. Talk about something. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, overall, the other interesting thing to look at is, I, like I said, I'm a little bit more mallet oriented. So I think it's very interesting to see players who the backgrounds that they come from. I think it's from what I've seen, it's much easier if you're a you know a snare drummer or very drumming oriented. I think it's much easier to switch over to something melodic like marimba or that type of um, instrument than it is for people who are used to playing marimba or more of a keyboard player to switch back over to the snare uh, or more of a more of a drumming focus. That's what I've seen. I'm sure you guys may. I mean, there are always exceptions, um, but that's what that's what I've um, you know seen a lot of. Um, but overall, you know, just think still understanding the importance of being a well-rounded percussionist mm -hmm. and ultimately you know really looking at what are college auditions these days uh you know what you know it's so even if at the end of high school one of my students is the best at drumming but also keyboard right there's definitely going to be some drum set on that college audition right i mean is, is are they going to be able to do several styles of that um all those different aspects of it um you know really looking into that there's always a uh, there's one day in percussion methods every semester where I get on like a soapbox and just rage about this and in Texas, like getting a one at like festival is such a big deal. And like, if you want to get a one, have the same kid play snare drum all the time. Sure. But like, that's terrible music education. And it just drives me nuts. Yeah. But anyway, I had a follow up question for this because we keep talking about drums and keyboards. And one thing I've noticed is I have literally never had a single student come in. Uh, and audition well on timpani. Um, and uh, yeah. I think that there's plenty of keyboard ensembles where people, you can collectively teach keyboards to a group. There's plenty of drum lines and things to teach drums. But as far as timpani, like I'm just drawing a loss as to how that can really be well covered. I mean, ideally you would have to have private lessons on it, but that's not always possible. So what is your solution for teaching timpani, especially at a young age? Well, I, I have a couple thoughts. Um, first one is I just try to get them hearing pitches more because as a percussionist, you don't have to be um, tuning things on regularly and developing your ear like everybody else does, which is such a big part of playing timpani. Um, so I try to, especially the middle schoolers, because I cycle them through timpani too, um, I just make sure that they're doing all the tuning themselves and not me, which sometimes turns out really bad. Um, but so also gets them going on that. And um, yeah, I, I just try to move the parts around and keep everybody playing. I don't think I'm by no means a timpani expert. Like I feel like that's probably one of my weaker areas in percussion overall. So I actually um, had a student who actually just showed up. He's over here uh, now because he's coming to take a lesson after this, but we can keep going. Um, Tristan, um, he was doing his college you. auditions. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he was at IMEA. Yeah. 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 Congrats on Eastman, Tristan. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty exciting. But cool. um, when he was prepping for his college auditions, I told him, all right, here's a tempting piece. Now go take a lesson from the professor at Indiana Purdue Fort Wayne, who's a uh, a great tempanist, Eric Schweikert is his name. He plays with the uh, Fort Wayne Philharmonic. And um, so he went over there and, and took a, a lesson from him and learned a lot that way. And 
Yeah. So. so I think there are just two things really quick on the timpani subject. Number one is in middle school, it's, it's the expertise. So I can definitely say I got to play a lot of timpani in middle school because I had piano lessons before I came into school, which my parents had made me take, you know, definitely not not willingly for me. But I came in and I was able to read bass clef. That was a huge huge, huge thing for the band director to be able to let me play timpani. In high school, it's more of an availability thing. I mean, when you really think about it, it's easy to teach a lot of multiple drummers. It's easy to have a lot of multiple keyboard inter- instruments. But really, for every student to get a quality time on timpani is a great challenge because, really you know, most schools only have access to one set, uh, through even throughout multiple bands, things like that. So yeah. I think developing a schedule even for you know, private lessons or, or being able, having the students, you know, say, hey, here's your time for timpani, use it and use it well, just to get exposed to it. I mean, even is, is a great thing that not a lot of kids have. Gotcha. Well, since uh, Tristan just showed up, there's I have a follow up question that he posts on Facebook. How do you deal with having such a super cool, dope, cool percussion student? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's kind of. <laughs> Is it, I don't know. Is it's, it a, it's, it's it's all right. Is it a burden at all? He said cool Definitely twice. Uh, <laughs> check check out this. Such a super cool, dope, cool percussion student. <laughs> what does that even mean? The, the second cool, I think, changes the connotation. I don't know. <laughs> he's not um, only super cool, but he's also cool. Oh, more oh, extra yeah, emphasis. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what it is. All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's just his resume right there. Yeah. And so, was that just the Eastman... That, uh, that, yeah. Application letter? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's what I put on okay. the recommendation. Yeah. Watch yeah. out, Mike Burrett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Hey, well, I think we have time for one quick little question, and it is from one of our regulars, Anna Elizabeth. Hi, Anna. She just asks you to speak a little bit about using your probably small budget effectively. Oh, yeah. Great question. Love um, that question. For me... I have been very fortunate in that I don't get told no a whole bunch from the band directors, um, which has been really great. But I um, I also know that we're limited. Uh, it, us, more than a lot of schools in our area for, for BAM, we don't have the, the same amount of funding that other schools do. But um, I think the the most important thing to do is kind of prioritize and then um, compartmentalize too, right? Because we're thinking about purchasing big capital equipment versus also the like necessary essentials that we need all the time. For for us, for marching band, we have four marimbas and three vibes on the field every year. And we need um, four different harnesses of mallets for each of those groups and they all need two pairs of each. So that's a huge expense that we have to have every year and basically completely buy new every year because they shred them throughout the season. Um, but we, um, like, so we have to think that's set aside. What else can we do and find room for other accessories and other large equipment in other areas? Um, the other thing that we do a lot of, and I think Indiana and probably Texas do the best jobs of, are just like fundraising like crazy. Right, right. Like Indiana marching bands are made by the band booster organizations. That's right. <laughs> they, the, the, um, our booster organization has done so much work to fund our program. Like we, my first year, I, um, I got, I got there a little late because they had a halftime director that, um, found a full-time job and he left and they brought me on after that. Um, and within probably the first month I was like, Oh, Hey, by the way, I think we need a five octave marimba. Like, I think that that is like the first thing that we need. Mm -hmm. And the director was like, okay. And he told the band boosters and they made it happen. Like it wasn't like they, they didn't have to do a ton of extra work to fundraise because they're just constantly doing that. So um, if you can get a booster organization, if you don't have one, like that's a huge, huge deal. And they'll, um, there are different ways we sell flowers. That's what we do. We sell bulbs and flowers. That's one of our big sales. We do a pancake breakfast. That's one of our big ways to raise money. Um, I've heard of other school. I mean, other schools sell like those, Crummy pizzas or, or fruit baskets or and you name it, things like that. Or yeah. those so, wrapping paper. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> See? All those really desirable items. But. <laughs> I'll say, I mean, 
So, I mean, I, I love, personally, I love the logistical side of all that as well. So I'll just say a couple things on that. I mean, first of all, one of the big things is if you're able to get any type of endorsement deal, which these days is, is you know, certainly not, you know, you can't just walk in and get one, but it's definitely pretty easy. If you're able to get some sort of stick and mallet deal, which is probably going to be the first thing as an educator you can get with either Vicver, Innovative, Promark, you name it. Um, that, that enables you to purchase sticks and mallet at a reduced rate, which enables them to offer your students a reduced rate as well. Uh, it all, uh, another thing a lot of people don't take into consideration are rewraps. So definitely at Goshen High School, a lot of drum corps, a lot of large organizations, you know, you don't have to buy any set of mallets when you need them. You can get those rewrapped, uh, things like that. And ultimately what it ends up having is two sets, ones that are getting rewrapped while you're using one, then you switch them out, things like that. Uh, I would say, um, you know, shameless plug for, for DCI, if you're looking at purchasing a Vibe or Marimba, uh, which I know Micah purchased two Vibes, definitely look at, you know, um, a DCI or WGI group. They typically use the, inf the instruments for one season, and the only way they're able to get new ones is if they sell these at a very discounted rate. Even for DCI, which spends three months uh, straight, basically outside with, you know, a marimba or a vibraphone, something like that. Even those instruments are typically in very good condition. The members take, of every group take very, like quite a bit of pride. I mean, that's their office space every day uh, in keeping those instruments um, very well taken care of. So you can typically get those at a pretty reduced sticker price, um, which is super helpful. Uh, for symbols, definitely if you have a year where you can just buy symbols, a lot of, uh, and I say this because both, I know both Sabian and Zildjian, both Sabian and Zildjian have rewards programs where it's either for the dollar amount or the number of symbols you buy, you get a certain dollar amount or number of symbols back, right? So if you're able to allocate and go to your band director and say, listen, we spend three grand on symbols, we can get X amount of free symbols. Right. And really maximize that. That's uh, another way you can do it. And then overall, just if you're able in any way, which I know this is uh, definitely a, so a different topic for everyone. But if you're able to get rid of any existing equipment to help put that finances towards new equipment, that's always a helpful thing. Now, I know every school has a bid process or something like that. And I know it's easier for some people than others. But I can just tell you, share one story of uh, at Goshen. We ended up selling all of our gear uh, to various schools around the country. Uh, and a lot of our gear was in decent condition. We have a couple of marimbas that were pretty deplorable, which we priced accordingly. Uh, and we were able to then buy new equipment in a bulk rate at a much, much lower price. We, uh, I specifically remember we sold a Dynasty marimba, uh, which was, we sold it for probably $1,500, right? And it had, I'm talking crack bars, and the person who bought this knew it. And we sent it to this school. And we got a phone call after it got there. And what are you expecting on the other end of this phone call? This instrument is such a piece of garbage, right? I mean, how in the world? And that's, that's the call I think we were expecting. And instead, we got a totally different call, which was, thank you guys so much. We've never had a marimba here. And this yeah. just means the absolute world of these kids to be able to get this instrument. And I think it's often easy to think that you have it the worst <laughs> at whatever school system you're in. Um, but realize that even whatever you can, whatever condition your instrument is in, if it's a working instrument, other people can benefit from that. And you can also benefit from that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, man, Micah Detweiler and Christian Good, man, thank you guys so much for um, stopping in. And it's great to see you guys again. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. And thanks for doing the podcast. Yeah. It's really awesome for, for guys like us that didn't necessarily go to a big university and have, you know, percussion history and a big percussion studio to gain knowledge from. For me, I've learned a ton from the podcast. So yeah. thanks yeah. thanks for letting us uh, really exercise our free speech right here. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's gonna be we'll... censored. Oh yeah, it's going to be just like omitted and bleeped out and voiceovers. <laughs> well, that means a lot. Thanks a lot, Mike. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, everybody. See you next week. All right.